And today I'm very excited to present uh, an idea that uh, I have been kind of like brainstorming over the past few months. I've been uh, working in collaboration with uh, a couple of friends at the Sandia National Laboratories. Uh, I would say, sadly, he couldn't come, but he has sent us a video to talk about uh, what they are doing at Sandia National Labs and why uh, the, this talk, right, best of both worlds, meaning the HPC supercomputing centers are looking into merging Kubernetes and SLORM, and this is something that they are working actively on. So with that, I will step and play this quick video. First QCon, I am also, uh, it is worth also mentioning that this is the first time I'm also getting married, hence why I can make it. <laughs> <laughs> now I'd like to introduce some of the topics that we're speaking about today. Um, our goal is to integrate SNRM with Kubernetes in a more cloud native way. What we'll be able to walk into some more details um, later on in the slides and then to the demo as well. First, I'd like to tell you a little bit about myself. I work mainly or primarily in the uh, government. In the government, um, I have 10 plus years of cloud computing work, cloud computing experience, working with scheduling, container orchestration, DevOps, and runtimes. I am serving as a senior member of the clinical staff at the National Laboratories. And with that, I'd like to pass it on to Eduardo for, uh, for his introduction. I hate it. Kind of like open it for me. Now so, I'd like to continue with the agenda. <laughs> first, provide an overview of SMD and the supporting projects of this effort. Then, we'll dive into some of the user demands that are driving this work the pathway to Kubernetes from virtualization and modernization. And then, we'll introduce um, K Foundry's role um, in the, as a framework for this work. Um, then, we'll dive into some concluding remarks, and finally, we'll be able to demonstrate how K-Foundry works. As in here, um, the main mission is national security. Just to give you a glimpse of SMDA's magnitude, we employ over 100,000 employees, out of which 15,000 are engineers and scientists, as well as 95,000 plus contractors. Um, with this idea, I work in the Center for Computer Research, in which our main objective is, is to create computer technology that addresses our nation's most demanding national security challenges. Within uh, Sandia, um, the advanced simulation computing uh, program was created, ASC, which is a program aimed to um, do what has never been done before. Um, and it is a pro it's a tri-lab effort among Sandia, Los Alamos National Labs, and Lawrence Livermore National Labs. It is also, it has also an industry component in which we aim to bring the most cutting edge technology into the labs. He also has an academia component, which aims to bring domain expertise to the labs. Now that we understand the ESC program, it is worth introducing um, some of the other projects that it is supporting. It is supporting the Accelerated Video Engineering ADE program, which is a program expanding, it's a project that is expanding computer needs through the pathfinding of hardware and software technologies. It is um, based, based on this, and the estimates that um, it would see is, is computing capacity in the next three to five years. Um, for these reasons, and the requires a unified modern infrastructure to better deliver computational power as a service. Um, and this, this image right here is, a, is what we envision, um, is, is how we envision the new engineering size capability that blends experimentation, data, and, and compute together. Now that we 
understand some of the projects that support Sandia National Laboratories. It is worth now highlighting some of the user demands that drive the capabilities. Um, in, in essence, tra traditionally, we present the HPC from the standpoint of interacting with, uh, with it from the command line legacy. Now, we are heading towards the automated world and more accessible world. Um, this is the reason why um, these efforts are, you know, new capabilities have to be enabled for domain scientists to actually perform work that is, um, that is of interest to national security. Um, we talk about the needs and the way we have progressed towards implementation. We have been working on virtualization technology since early 2000s, and now, you know, for our first deployment of Kubernetes, we attempted to enable different aspects of computing of the computing environment and prototype to adapt different computing components. Hence, it is a list that is, in, you know, over the over the green circle. Now. Um, in, in, you know, as we continue to move on to, to you know, in this new phase, uh, we continue to push further into our production systems, as well as also continue R and D um, to research and to understand uh, new capabilities within the space of cloud computing. Now that we understand, also, you know, our, you know, our goal, our roadmap, and you know how we have gotten here. It is worth understanding that K Foundry aims to bridge the gaps across all computing. So we would like to move, um, we would like to leave um, the underlying infrastructure the way it is, and we'd like to interact with it without having to do many changes to it. Um, we wanted to leverage cloud technologies that were already open source, um, open source technologies to have more flexibility um, at the time that we start um, enabling. In this particular case, K Foundry is, is actually um, uh, is we're leveraging KCP um, to enable. Uh, we're repurposing KCP to enable the interaction with multiple um, computing spaces or computing environments within Sandia. Our big our big opportunity here is that we. Um, Big opportunity here is that we like to take all the progress we've made, we, we've, we've made in HPC over the over the years to essentially supercharge cloud ecosystems. In this case, it could be an in-house hybrid cloud ecosystem, or it could just be a public cloud ecosystem. We like to essentially um, bring the most um, cutting-edge resources and make them available to scientists without them having to become um, experts. Talking about experts, um, this is the way it is envisioned ultimately. Engineers and designers will navigate to a web portal of this uh, that looks similar to something like this. Now, they would have a menu of simulations and then they could pick from, they pick their simulation, they'll be able to receive the resource interactively and in essence, this effort aims to democratize HPC by offering its performance without requiring researchers to become HPC experts. We would like to treat HPC as a service, not as a special one-off resource. Finally, ADE, or Accelerated Digital Engineering goals, is to support diverse computing needs. Our solution, um, supports in computing environments from Kubernetes clusters to large HPC setups. Um, we also aim to support interactive and long containerized HPC applications. Sandia is committed to evolving our support for diverse computing demands, driving forward adaptability and efficiency of computational workloads. I'd like to thank all the, um, all the contributors to this work still is an ongoing work. However, we continue to um, try to pave the way to enable this ecosystem. Now I'd like to move on to Eduardo who will take over and actually demonstrate how KeyFinder works. All righty, now we are here. So uh, this demonstration, the, this 
first part of the presentation was to show the importance that many customers out there and users in the community overall has this need of merging what is a Slurm uh, or Flux or any other HPC type of resource with Kubernetes. And as, as we saw during the presentation, uh, they are even using Kubeflow, right? So it shows that uh, even for national security purposes, uh, they have the need to play with uh, cloud native tooling. And this is key and important for them. So they need to have a way to have a Slurm, HPC, uh, and also to have Kubernetes playing side by side because it's important for their mission. And the thing that we need to have in mind here is that depending on the mission, they have different clusters. Just at Sandia, not the, any other labs that he mentioned, uh, they could have 10, 20, or 30 different clusters, and each one is set up for a specific mission or you will, we will say like a specific scientific uh, purpose. So uh, what I want to walk through here is how we got into uh, the idea that we're working on. And the first thing that I want to talk about is the Kubernetes HPC efforts, right? Uh, sometimes it feels that we are trying to use uh, the wrong tool to get things done because we, we look at these HPC laboratories, we see them running a slurm over thousands of, of jobs, and we are like, oh, let's try the same in Kubernetes, and, and we try it the hard way, right? And we have been making efforts as a community, right? Like, uh, even at this uh, KubeCon, we discussed about working group serving and working group device management. There are new, the new working groups, but we also have the CNC, uh, CNCF research user group, the BASH working group from CNCF, and the BASH, BASH working group from Kubernetes, and more to come, right? Like, the need keeps growing, and it, it keeps growing the need for us to sit down as a community and discuss about what needs to be done and to bridge this gap between traditional HPC and cloud native applications. Also, as a community, we have done really nice things, right? Like the Project Q, the, the Job Set API, uh, we saw Q uh, exposed at the, at the keynote on Wednesday, so it gets to show that it is already being used in production, and there, there is already uh, customers like CERN using Q for like big scientific deployments. Also in scheduling, we have as a community the scheduling plugin that enables us to do things like the, the Flux framework operator. And also, uh, what was introduced uh, recently as Linky from SkedND and distributed computing like M the MPI operator that is still under uh, the Kubeflow organization. But what's uh, like the key role here for like the difference between a Slurm and Kubernetes? So when we say Kubernetes in, in this HPC conversation, we are basically referring to the cube scheduler that is the scheduler component of Kubernetes. It's a, a solution and containerized uh, workload management is made for cloud native ecosystem and it requires to enable plugins so you can run things like Slurm, LSF, uh, uh, the Flux uh, operator that also allows you to plug in Flux into Kubernetes. But at the end of the day, the plugins that, and, and the steps of the scheduling decision that this scheduling plugin gives us is not powerful enough, right? Like it, it falls short and in any hallway track conversation, I keep hearing people like, yeah, it's not enough. We, we wanna rewrite the scheduler, we did this, we did that. So everyone is coming with a different solution on how to bypass the cube scheduler. But Q is already demonstrating really interesting things and Q attached with the leader working set and the job set API is taking us to new fields that we never dreamed possible for Kubernetes maybe two, three years ago. And now we see these demos uh, being run at keynotes from CERN where they are running thousands of pods and they are doing uh, queuing and bashing on Kubernetes nodes. We are still far away from what a traditional HPC cluster is, but uh, it doesn't mean that we need to get there, right? This is, this is the whole point of the conversation. Kubernetes was made for a specific use case, and we are making it better to be the de facto inf uh, resource management for infrastructure, but Slurm is still a tool, and, and we need to use it. We don't need to uh, grow Kubernetes uh, complex and complex forever if there are tools there that we can leverage. So for those that didn't attend the, the, the keynote, 
uh, Q, from a very high point of view, is a QN operator. It's very slim implementation, so it basically doesn't consume resources and uh, allows you to maximize the resource consumption or resource management of your Kubernetes cluster when you need a queuing or bashing system in Kubernetes. And it has full compatibility with the ecosystem, which is a, a key thing that I want to drive towards this presentation. Is Q, uh, as we all know, it works with Kubeflow, it works, it works with Ray, it works with uh, the MPI operator, and basically everyone is adding themselves to Q so they can leverage the Q APIs. But for those that are new to today's conversation is what is a Slurm from a very, very high point of view, right? So we are all used to looking at the Kubernetes architecture, and we know that there is the master node, the, the control plane, the worker nodes. So if we look at this picture from really far away, it looks like Kubernetes, but it's actually a slurm, right? So it has the, the log, what will be the login node, what will be the controller demos that run on the, on the worker, for us in the Kubernetes community is the worker nodes, and, and the slurm D that is what actually could be translated as the kubelet, right? So like this, is, this image is very interesting because if you look at it from really far away, it looks very similar to Kubernetes architecture. So showing that Slurm is also a nice tool and we can leverage it for what it is, right? And the thing that uh, also we need to, to bear in mind is that Slurm has support for things like PMIX that still in Kubernetes is a far dream ahead. Right, the MPI operator is still not ready to support the standard of PMIX, and Slurm basically today runs on thousands of nodes on these national laboratories and is helping us with national security. It is used for, as we saw in the presentation, for big deployments for uh, academia and research, but uh, it's complex to maintain and. Uh, it's particularly complex to maintain with containerized workloads, right? And, but w w what are the gaps? So, as I said from, from the Q slide, one of the gaps is the integration with the cloud native tooling. And here is where, where this whole presentation uh, came to life. It's like, we would like to also have the, the API set that we like from Kubernetes and enable specific cloud native tools, but for Slurm, that as of today, it, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't have integration with cloud native tools, like let's say Kubeflow or things like that. And it's very challenging to, to learn. Uh, I keep hearing that it's harder and harder to get good Slurm system admins, and mostly it's because of the hype of Kubernetes, uh, as like newborn students prefer to do their masters in, in something related to Kubernetes because it will guarantee them a, a job. So it's like uh, we, we need to take these things into account when, when thinking in, in Slurm. Then how do we merge things? And there is a really interesting project born a couple of years ago that is the Kubernetes control planes. The Kubernetes control planes, or KCP for short, is a project that is aimed to have a Kubernetes-like control plane, but it focuses on just an isolated clusters. And initially, it was designed for the multi-cluster ecosystem, but it has been growing to support all sorts of use cases. And basically, is an easy API that you can plug on top of anything you want. So what we really like from Kubernetes like one of the key features that we all like from Kubernetes as a, as a community, as an ecosystem, is that it, it is a uniform API, right? And that's the API design, and, and when we are designing new APIs, and we are uh, creating caps to modify an API in Kubernetes, we know how hard and how big that is, right? Like APIs are the core of Kubernetes, are what we like. If you have an API, you can just move around from cloud to cloud. You can move around from uh, bare metal to the cloud and back because you know that the API is going to be the same. So KCP allows us to have that, to have a uniform API where we can basically just plug in underlying solutions because uh, KCP is Kubernetes without the concept of infrastructure. It's just the ITC component. I think I have it here. So it's ITC, the API server, and the controller manager and everything else is gone, right? Like, it's like 
a very trimmed down version of Kubernetes. So if we have this trimmed down version of Kubernetes that doesn't know what a pod is, what a container is, what a node is, but it does know what RBAC is, secrets, namespaces, config map, and the most important thing of all, it notes what a custom resource definition is. So it allows us to create APIs like we do for Kubernetes, but for anything we want. And in this case, Slurm. So we can create CRDs for Slurm jobs. So introducing uh, KFoundry, pardon the name, I'm bad with naming, uh, and it's basically trying to address the, the idea of we want to run Slurm next to Kubernetes and we want them to be friends. Right? Like we, want, we want them to play nice along each other. But how do we reach the last mile? So recently, uh, Slurm also released the Slurm REST D, which allow us to communicate with Slurm via an, an open API uh, 3.0 compatible. So basically, we can do HTTP calls to Slurm from a high level point of view, right? It, it runs in two modes, so uh, Unix socket or TCP, depending on your security or your use cases. Uh, for these specific use cases, we are going TCP, but uh, it could also be run via Unix socket. Uh, the, in the security point of view, it runs via uh, JSON web token, so that's the, the way you authorize against the, the REST D API. So from a high level perspective, what K400 gave us, right? So users basically uh, do a kubectl create job, it will get into K Foundry, and depending if it has a, an, a label or annotation in the metadata of the job, K Foundry will decide if this job goes to a regular Kubernetes cluster or a Slurm cluster, right? This is one of the characteristics that uh, KCP uh, brings to the table, is that KCP allows us to have multiple consumers. Uh, it, it, it is called consumers on the KCP API, but it's basically like multiple clusters. But how does it look uh, from a more deep dive point of view? So we do a job request, KCP then puts this into ITSI, and we using the controller manager, this all sounds like Kubernetes to this point. So using the controller manager, KFoundry, you can look at it as a, as a operator. Basically, KFoundry is an operator. It, it reads that it, there is a new entry on ITSI from the CRDs that we define, that in this case is a job. And then depending if it needs to go to Kubernetes or not, it will launch it to Kubernetes. And if not, it will translate the CRD from a, a basic Kubernetes job into the HTTP call of a Slurm job, right? So it will do the translation from the CRD to the, to the REST API call for Slurm. It will then run the post to the REST API of Slurm, and it will update the ITC CRD with the information that comes back from Slurm, uh, reporting the job ID and if the job uh, is done or not, and the logs, and you name it. It also provides a multi-cluster approach, so as I was saying at the beginning, uh, KCP allow us to have multiple clusters with multiple uh, definitions of cluster. And this is very important for uh, systems like Sandia, where they have multiple clusters and each cluster has a mission. So we could create like a job controller or a job router with uh, labels and annotations to tell uh, KFoundry where to route the job depending on the job mission. And thanks to KCP and that we can create CRDs, we still have the concept of nodes and jobs and into uh, KCP now. So we can do to, uh, things like kubectl get nodes and actually what gets reported back are the Slurm job, the Slurm nodes, not uh, Kubernetes cluster nodes. So it's, uh, we are uh, basically translating the REST API layer from Slurm into Kubernetes CRDs. And with that, I will here. So uh, I will run a quick demo. It's just to show, so on, on the lower side, I think if you can see it, uh, I'm running just a wash on, on, on SQ. So I'm, I'm requesting as Lauren to tell me if there are jobs running. Uh, here I have the logs from KFoundry. And here I will, More? There. 
it's hard to see in this is in the in, in the laptop already. So uh, I'm going to run this Kubernetes job, but you can see here that it is a, a custom resource definition, so it's not a, a Kubernetes a, a batch uh, B1 job, it's a, a CRD. But the rest is the same. Basically, I, I have the Kubernetes job uh, as, as the API itself when defining the CRD, and I will run a, a, a sleep, right? Like I, all I wanna show is that we can go all the way to the slurm and back. So when we run this, hopefully if, well, it was running before doing the zoom. <laughs> yeah, so I don't know why the last part is not showing, maybe it's already to zoom out, but as we can see here, the job was deployed and is uh, providing all sorts of metadata and it's telling us that it has a job ID two in a slurm, right? I, I think we zoom it too, too much and that's why it's not showing here. Uh, but yeah, it basically run the job via slurm and it's reporting the status back from the job. So it's the job uh, ID two and it's sleeping for 100 seconds. So we, what we can do now with this is that we can deploy jobs to a slurm, we can uh, delete jobs from a slurm, and also the good thing here is that uh, we can have RBAC, so we can map uh, RBAC from Kubernetes to a slurm users because uh, it is being handled via the JSON web tokens, so we can create JSON web tokens uh, per user in a slurm. So we could create like a one-on-one -on -one mapping. Why is it not showing? It's weird that it's updating up there, but not here. But yeah, uh, and with that, uh, I'm going to open for questions. Huh? Ah, perhaps. I think I need to exit and get back again. No, it's not showing weird, but it's updating up there. Um, <clears throat> I didn't catch it during the presentation, but is uh, KFoundry altogether going to be open sourced? Yes. Okay. Uh, do you have a timeline on that? Uh, yeah, uh, next week. Yeah, so basically, I, I had it open source. Yeah, I had it open source when I was working with uh, with the Sandia guys, but for for KubeCon we we shut it down. But yeah, next week I will open source it again. Cool. Thank you. Two questions. Uh, one, can you still? Can you? Oh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Two questions. One, can you still hit Slurm normally with the setup? Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah so if researchers like a. Hey, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna use this control plane. They can still. Yeah, no. Uh, the, so a slurm rest is a, it's like an optional thing, right? So you you have a, your slurm cluster running, and then you enable the slurm rest, right? Okay. So once it's enabled, we can then run KCP and, and and all this infrastructure on top of. But if you want to, you can still SSH and do your stuff, right? The the whole point of this of this is to. Uh, in one of the slides that uh, Angel was showing in this slide is that, uh, as you can see here where it says advanced DevOps, uh, at Sandia what they wanna do is that they have a centralized GitLab and like using GitLab pipelines, you could, uh, or, or like Argo CD or you name it, right? Like using Kubernetes abstractions, you could deploy to Slurm, deploy to Kubernetes and get all the information back in a, what the promise of KCP is in a single API, right? Nice. And then a little off topic, you said you're a singularity, you used to be a singularity engineer, right? Yeah, yeah, I was uh, one of the initial. Yeah, uh, do, do you still see, uh, I, can, I can ask that one later, but do, do you see more OCI containers used or do you see singularity containers still used? Like has that, all, all of it. Uh, oh, yeah. I cannot speak too much because I'm not a U.S. citizen, and we will get into weird conversations here. Sure. Uh, but yeah, uh, 
I think I can say they run multiple container runtimes because uh, part of being security, a national security lab, they don't want to tie to one, so they run Podman in singularity. Thank you. Are the rest of the SQ arguments that you'd normally provide just part of your resource spec? So like number of processes, ranks per process, that kind of thing? Uh, yeah, yeah, it basically, it, we can basically translate uh, a Kubernetes job into a, a Slurm job. Sure, so if I already know what my Slurm job looks like and I already have a submission script and I have a bunch of arguments that I make to SQ, are those just things I would provide to the spec in your resource? Yeah. Okay. And yeah, it, it will map back. So if right now I, I'm kind of like starting from scratch because I'm running a Slurm on uh, the uh, SkateMD has like a, a Slurm on Docker Compose. So I'm basically running a Slurm here. Sure. But if you were like running a Slurm and you had like a big queue, uh, what K Foundry will do is that it will grab the jobs there via the reconciliation loop of the controller runtime and one by one translate it back to, to CRDs. Okay, thanks. Yeah, the same thing for, for nodes, right? Like you have nodes and it will uh, do the S info, kind of like yeah, yeah. S info, and it will try to lay the S info response into the, uh, the Kubernetes nodes. Of course, it's not going to fill all the fields of a, of a Kubernetes nodes API, but uh, it will do the best to, to fill that. Thanks. Uh, two questions. Uh, how do you pass uh, the URL of Slurm cluster uh, from Kubernetes, do you need to specify it in every job or is it possible to specify once for each cluster in some configuration? So that's one question. And second, uh, is it possible to get, or oh, maybe you're already doing that, uh, monitoring from Slurm into Kubernetes uh, the metrics if uh, Slurm has some um, logs and metrics, is it possible to get into Kubernetes world? Uh, it's possible, but it's not, uh in what I have done for KFoundry is not yet implemented, but the whole idea is that since we have the, uh, the Cube uh, API server and Etsy, we can uh, scrap as much information as possible from Slurm and then uh, put it up as we are used to in Kubernetes with Prometheus, Grafana, and all of that for metrics. And your first question is not actually uh, answered by, by KFoundry, my project, is basically answered by KCP itself. So it has uh, primitives to attach uh, clusters one by one. It is called a consumer. But uh, yeah, you can, you can basically attach as many clusters as you want. So you talked a lot about the KCP to Slurm side of things, but I'm a bit confused how the KCP to Kubernetes side of things works. Because KCP is a control plane, but it's, it doesn't have a data plane. Does your Kubernetes cluster then have to be headless, or do you have two control planes that are stomping on each other? No, no, no. It's a, so KCP initially, so when I started looking at it, it was just like a, a multi-cluster platform, right? Okay. So it's a, a control plane for routing jobs to different clusters. But your Kubernetes cluster can be a regular. Okay, so it just submits it to the control plane at yeah. that cluster, and then that control plane takes over. And all it's yeah, doing is watching it's, the state. You can also picture it as the concept of, of uh, multi-cluster queue that was presented at the keynote. is You have a bunch of Kubernetes cluster, and you start routing jobs to each one. Okay, I'll, it's just routing then. It's not actually a control plane for that cluster. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, no more questions. So. Uh, thank you everyone and uh, we can go back home now. <laughs>